Thank you for joining us. We're going to begin this session in just a few minutes uh, in about 60 seconds. Please stand by. Wow, Rico. <laughs> All right, it looks like we have a great number of participants on the line already, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to our webinar on preparing vulnerable Californians for natural disasters. Is your community ready or at least up? I'm Erica Manuel, the CEO and Executive Director of the Institute for Local Government, and I'll be your moderator today. Next slide. We are recording today's webinar and we'll share the recording, uh, the slide deck and related resources with all the registrants before, uh, before the uh, via email following this webinar. All of your lines have been muted for the duration of the webinar, but you can ask a question at any time by typing it into the questions box on the right hand side of your screen. If you have any technical difficulties during this session or any questions of our panelists during their presentations, please feel free to use that function. So this webinar is designed to help local government officials and their staff and other community-based organizations understand the risks that some of our most vulnerable residents are facing as it relates to natural disasters. We're going to talk about how we as leaders can help ensure that immigrants, non-English speakers, seniors, communities of color, people with disabilities, and the poor are not left behind literally or figuratively. We're going to share some data-driven best practices for effectively engaging and educating vulnerable communities about disaster preparedness, and we're going to share information about tools and resources to help. We do know that COVID response and recovery has been a major priority for local agencies this year, but as we move deeper into our traditional fire season, it's important to remember that there are concurrent threats to our community. We have to remain vigilant about COVID response, but we also have to do everything possible to prepare for a natural disaster that could strike at any time, like a wildfire or an earthquake. Next slide. So this is the agenda for today's discussion. Uh, I wanna give you an overview of the technology and logistics and then drive right into the content. I'll start with a short overview of ILG for those of you who are not familiar with our organization. And then we'll have presentations from our main panelists before jumping into the Q&A. Our four panelists should be visible at the top of your screens, and I'll introduce them more formally in just a few minutes. We have Karen Baker and Justin Knighton with the Listos campaign, if you guys want to wave. Excellent. They're the co-chairs of the Listos California campaign, and they're going to provide an overview of that important campaign being run out of the Office of Emergency Services. And then to provide a local perspective, we have County Supervisor Tom Wheeler from Madera County. Tom, wave to us. Hello. And Rico Peralta with the United Way of Madeira and Fresno. Hey, Rico. So we structured this webinar to allow plenty of time for questions. So there will be a Q&A at the end and a contact info for everybody that's on this panel. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about how this webinar will work. Even though we have been sheltering in place for about four months now, every technology solution is a little bit different, and we uh, want to make sure we clarify the technical details with all of you. So for today, as I mentioned, all participants will be on mute during the entire presentation. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type those questions into the question box at any time during the webinar. One thing to note, the question box is not the chat box. Um, the ILG team will actually work throughout the webinar to review all the questions and determine the best time to ask them during the webinar. Questions about logistics can be asked and answered in the chat box, which is visible to everyone, and questions about the presentations or things directly for our panelists should be asked in the Q&A box, and that will be answered during the Q&A portion of the webinar at the end of the agenda. We'll also be playing a video during this presentation, and you definitely want to hear that video. So when the video gets loaded up, in order to hear the video, you will need to have your computer audio turned on, even if you're listening by phone. Um, so that should 
uh, handle all the technical elements associated with the webinar. Next slide. So at this point in our webinar, we would love to know who's on the line. We can't see your faces, but we definitely want to know who's with us. So if you wouldn't mind, please tell us a little bit about yourself. We have two poll questions that will help our panelists better plan for your questions. My ILG colleague, Randy Kay, is behind the scenes working on the technology for this session, so she will be administering the poll. Randy Kay, please proceed. Great, and here we go. We've got lots of people from the city, 38% city representatives, 9% uh, county, 10% special district, and 20% state agency or department, and 23% private, corporate, or nonprofit. Well, welcome, we're happy to have you. There is one more question we've got, and uh, we'll get that result as well. What best describes your relationship to local government? Are you staff? Are you an elected official? Are you a consultant, a community-based organization, or nonprofit partner, or other? Happy to have all of you on the line. We just definitely want to make sure that we tailor our content and our uh, answers to questions to the things that you might be the most interested in. Excellent. We've got a lot of staff and elected officials and consultants. This is fantastic. 53% staff, 17% community-based organizations, um, consultants and elected officials are also, and then an other bucket, which is a catch-all for everything. We love that. Um, it's really great to see so many staff members from local agencies on the line. We do know that staff does a lot of the heavy lifting as it relates to these efforts, and this is super important that you've joined us today. So thank you so much. All right, next slide. Before we dive into the presenter introductions, I want to tell you just a little bit about the Institute for Local Government. As I mentioned during my intro, my name is Erica Manuel. I am the CEO and Executive Director of ILG. I've been at the helm for about 18 months, and you know, just like you, we are navigating COVID. We're in the middle of you know a really difficult uh, crisis to hit local government, probably the biggest one in 100 years. But the good news for you, if you're a local agency, is that ILG is nonpartisan. We're nonprofit, and we are here to help. We are the nonprofit training and education affiliate of three statewide associations representing local governments, CSAC, the League of California Cities, and the California Special Districts Association. Together with our three affiliates, we serve over 2,500 local agencies that include cities, counties, and special districts. And we love it when they collaborate together to make uh, effective use of local government. We provide practical and easy to use resources so local agency leaders can really implement policies on the ground and do it well. And we love and understand government and local government. And that's why everything we do really centers around helping local leaders navigate the complexity of their role. And that's one of the reasons why we're so excited about this webinar today. There are a few things that are more complex than emergency management in the face of natural disasters. Next slide. ILG has four main program areas or pillars of work. We do leadership and governance, civics education and workforce, public engagement, and sustainable and resilient communities. And our mission is, again, to help local government leaders navigate complexity, increase capacity, and build trust in their communities. And campaigns like Listos are definitely complementary to that effort. Um, we provide at ILG a range of services across all of our pillars. We do education and training like this webinar, but we also offer deep technical assistance and capacity building to help stretch your ability to deliver on programs and services. We also convene key stakeholders and provide facilitation services around sticky or challenging topics when it's really helpful to have a neutral party in the room to kind of understand how local government works. Next slide. 
On this slide, we're just outlining a number of resources you can find on our webpage related to our pillars and this session in particular. In our leadership and governance pillars, we have information ranging from effective boards and councils, decision making, and others, and ethics, for example. Uh, in our public engagement section on the website, you can learn about the basics of public engagement, find out about our tiers public engagement framework, and learn about language access tools and support. And you're going to hear about engaging with vulnerable populations. That's a huge part of this. And certainly language uh, access and translation are sometimes important elements to have in your plan and in your toolbox. And in our sustainable and resilient communities section, you can learn about how to integrate equity and resilience into your mitigation and climate programs. And a lot of times disasters tied very closely to this. So some things you can look at on our website when you have the time. Next slide. We also have a COVID page, um, definitely to help make sure local leaders have the resources they need to navigate the crisis. It's updated regularly. Please feel free to check that out. And the next slide, please. Uh, shameless plug for our next free webinar. It's Monday, August 17th, and we have partners with SoCal Gas to bring in world-renowned natural disaster expert, Dr. Lucy Jones, to show us how science and effective planning can help us better understand our risk to earthquakes, wildfires, and mudslides and how to address them at the local level, particularly in light of the pandemic. In this free webinar, you're gonna learn about tools to assess, mitigate, prepare for the disruption of a major disaster, as well as some very specific solutions related to building resilience around energy infrastructure. So we're finalizing the details this week. Registration will open soon and we hope you will join us. Um, it will be another free webinar from ILG. All right, so let's get to our featured presentation. Uh, today's presenters, next slide. We are joined today by four panelists with in-depth information about disaster preparedness in vulnerable communities. We're gonna hear from our speakers and then we're gonna go into a Q&A where we can dive deeper on, into the issues that matter the most to you. Um, so uh, we are so grateful to have a dynamic duo on the line today. It's the Listos campaign team of Karen Baker and Justin Knighton. Um, I'll introduce Karen and Justin and then they will introduce Rico and Supervisor Wheeler. So Karen Baker is the architect and co-chair of the Lisa of California Emergency Preparedness Campaign. She is a nationally recognized leader, a strategist, and community problem solver, and she just works tirelessly, like day and night, uh, to really address California's most pressing issues through volunteer service, partnerships, and I think some very, very innovative program design. Karen has held cabinet posts under the last three California governors, Governor Newsom, Brown, and Schwarzenegger. Last year, she was tapped by Governor Newsom to be the architect and co-chair of the Listos California campaign, which is what you're going to hear about today. Listos is a campaign focusing on people-centered efforts that ensure that our most vulnerable and diverse Californians are prepared. Karen also serves as a senior advisor at Cal OES. Previously, she held several leadership positions at a lot of nonprofits and even served on the team that created the AmeriCorps program during the Clinton administration, which is huge and what a legacy. So thank you, Karen, for being here. And next is Justin Knighton. <laughs> Justin Knighton is the co-chair of the Listos campaign. Justin is an expert public affairs and communication strategist, which I can attest to, and a vivid storyteller and a passionate advocate for equity, inclusion, and human rights. In 2019, Justin was appointed by Direct, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom to serve as the assistant deputy director in Cal OES's, uh, at Cal OES and the co-chair of Listos California. He's also recently joined the National Advisory Council of the New Next Gen Chamber of Commerce. So prior to all of this exciting and important work, Justin served as a senior vice president at a Sacramento-based public affairs firm, a global public affairs director for Harvey Milk Foundation, and in the office of the secretary at the Cal EPA. So thank you both so much for being here today. Um, as a reminder, attendees, you may ask questions via the question box throughout the presentation, and we're gonna try and get to as many as possible during the Q&A portion. And Listo's team, I'm going to turn the controls over to you. Well, first of all, thank you so much to ILG and to all of you who have been able to join us today. It, it matters very much to us that you're on the line and that we can take some time to hopefully uh, share with you this campaign and how we'd like you all to be a part of it. Um, I'll go ahead and go to the first slide here. Um, this starts with, um, you know, our governor. This was both he and the legislature working together in, with a trailer bill, AB 72, that was really going to be um, important because they wanted to be able to invest in ensuring that vulnerable communities would be really prepared in times of disaster. And at the time, the focus was natural disasters. It's 
since it includes COVID. But um, you see here his quote that it's a, going to be a people-centered approach. That was really critical to the whole architecture of this, of this campaign. And the campaign is a series of grants that are given out to local nonprofits, um, community-based organizations. There's 24 counties that competed and were able to be selected to receive resources. Uh, Rico, who we'll be introducing um, later with United Way of, of Fresno, is one of those CBOs. So 24 counties uh, received the grant. They, in turn, take the dollars that they receive and subgrant it to additional smaller nonprofits that can effectively reach the um, community members that really represent the makeup of their unique county. That's, that's the whole kind of design, is to ensure that it's going out the door through a nonprofit kind of trusted broker uh, that community members are really going to feel comfortable connecting to. Um, we spent a lot of time with uh, these nonprofits to educate them about disaster. They were not selected because of their, they were disaster gurus. They were selected because they knew the community. And they were really folks that we felt could take these um, taxpayer dollars and be able to effectively invest them in these people-centered strategies uh, to get people educated. Because at its heart, this is an education campaign that needs to be able to reach people that are vulnerable. And we define vulnerability as people that are in poverty, people that are um, disabled, are older Californians, non-English speakers, and other diverse factors, African American, also LGBTQ community members, a variety of folks. So these are, these are the community of people that often are um, not educated in preparedness. Um, and as we all know, if you're not educated in preparedness and an event comes, you have a higher risk of uh, being affected. Uh, so we're trying to, the whole purpose of this whole campaign is to really target those vulnerable community members, provide information in language um, so that we can meet you where you are. Um, I'll turn it over to my co-chair, Justin, for other introductory remarks and the next slide. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, we'll jump to the next slide. Um, also wanted to say thank you to Erica and ILG for all the work you do. Um, you know, the the partnerships and the work of local government right now, now more than ever during this pandemic, um, upcoming crisis within a crisis that will likely experience with the pandemic, in addition to wildfire season, in addition to power shutoffs, in addition to potential earthquake, um, the work you're doing and the work of all those that you, that you represent um, are just uh, so essential right now and we're seeing that in real time. Um, so thank you um, for creating this space um, for everyone on the line. Um, I will say that, you know, while this is a really conversation around what East Coast California is doing and those of you that are on the line that are in the regions where we have campaign dollars and partnerships, um, this is going to be a direct sync um, uh, for you in this conversation because there's something like actually very tangible and um, next steps um, to, to pursue for all those not within the, you know, defined county parameters of this campaign because we are only in very targeted counties based on the grant funding that we were um, allotted by the legislature and governor um, everything that we design everything we produce all the materials all the research all the work we've done is available to all to all counties to use um, to inform to um, kind of empower and to, to help you and arm you with the tools that you need to to, to reach communities so while you know, as we have this conversation about East Coast California and share the examples of um, both um, our partner uh, Rico and Supervisor Wheeler, that who we will introduce to you soon, um, mm. just wanted to flag that because it's really important to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Um, I'm here live in the State Operations Center. Karen is, is as well at the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, and um, really thankful for this conversation because we can't do it alone and we need partnership across the state of those who are actually connected to community in authentic ways. When we were charged with leading this effort as a pilot program, basically, you know, the work that has happened um, to date and preparedness um, has created a good foundation, but in a state with an uptick of disaster, 
um, especially wildfire, um, we have to do it differently because we know that those that are the most vulnerable, the list that Karen just gave, um, are, the, are disproportionately impacted, um, are hit the hardest. And on top of, um, you know, you know, issues of systems of oppression and bias that exist at every level that we've seen, like this has created a dynamic in which our communities um, don't always get the support, intentional investment, um, collaborative, you know, dynamic engagement and conversation because we know the government, you know, the legislature, the governor knows that our local partners are strapped for capacity, for resources. Um, we know that first responders and the pool of first responders is, is a limited pool, um, especially when there's catastrophic fires. I think the governor announced last week at a press conference um, that California has already had 638 wildfires um, or fires um, that didn't escalate to a threshold that um, created a dynamic in which the state operations center had to activate um, our local partners at the county level were able to um, you know, manage those, um, but I think mm. it's a taste of what's to come and, and how many resources it's going to take. And a campaign like this, from the onset, had to be about data and information. And that's the first thing we did. We knew, based on the architecture of this campaign that Karen Baker um, designed, of giving local community the power and the, and the directive to determine how best to work with their community, how best to build authentic relationships, leverage the credibility and the work that they've already have been doing and have done for decades um, to, to, to be that trusted uh, messenger. Um, at a time when there's a lot of question and doubt, um, they become a partner, right? Local partners like United Way become a partner in doing that work um, to, to reach community. And, um, and, and having a dynamic in which that flexibility was possible, we had to have the data mm. and, and, the, and the facts. And so one of the first things we did um, was look at um, census tract data to understand where vulnerable people live and Cal OES's hazard maps for earthquake, wildfire, and flood. We worked with a professor at Sacramento State University to merge those two maps together for the very first time. So now in every county in the state, we now know where vulnerable people live based on census tract, and what specifically, where do they live as it relates to wildfire, earthquake, and um, flood zones. So that's all data that our partners have used to help shape and inform their outreach in different communities and neighborhoods. We're using it at a statewide level to determine things like media buys, um, both for broadcast, you know, billboards, digital, um, and other outreach strategies of where we have to build new partners, um, we have that data. And that data is all available to you all um, and your colleagues to understand where you may be able to put more attention and outreach um, to reach the communities that are going to be the most impacted if one of these crises hit, especially during a pandemic. We use that information to actually engage a firm, EMC Research, a national firm out of Oakland, um, to do... Uh, some message testing, both focus groups, phone surveys, and um, a, a poll. Um, the style of this campaign is more, screams more voter engagement kind of grassroots strategy uh, with our ground game, with our partners and our air game, um, with uh, uh, the communications and the storytelling aspect um, than it does resemble a traditional government program. And so we wanted to make sure that our messaging and the and the, the things that we say and that we advocate for and the way we communicate with the people are all based on what they said. So we use these maps with EMC, these vulnerability maps, to actually target where to do focus groups, who to contact for phone surveys, and where best to do outreach for um, our poll to come up with really interesting data. Again, all that data is available to um, all of our partners. Um, and one thing that I think people assumed in that work is that um, a lot of assumptions about why people don't prepare in a state like California, right? We see during wildfire season, all the fires. I mean, I was in India last year um, during two years ago uh, during the campfire, and it was on regular daily news in India, the California fires. Um, mm. And um, and our data actually proves and shows that vulnerable people at 88% know that they need to get prepared. The message of get prepared it, it, it's worked. <laughs> People know. They got it. Get prepared. They know that they got to do it. But they also don't do it. 
and they don't do it because the majority of those that, that very um, 88% don't get prepared because it's time consuming, it's expensive, and they feel that it's scary. And so part of our challenge has been from day one, how do we approach community in authentic ways with messages that are simple and straightforward and direct? Um, and we kind of remove the scare tactics and make it more about people power, um, empowering, dynamic, fun, engaging, something that people can have ease of mind because they're doing very simple things here and there that will protect themselves, their families, and their communities. And we'll get more, um, we'll go into more detail about what uh, our data showed and has transpired through this campaign. Next slide. Um, so a, a couple of other things that we wanted you to know about kind of what informed our campaign and continues to inform it is that we have a 25 member plus advisory team that really is comprised of all the, the diversity of California. Um, and these are phenomenal people that are providing us counsel on the materials, giving us counsel on our tactics and strategies. Uh, and of course, they're giving up their time. They're great volunteers that are helping us out. And there are our subject and population um, experts. So we're really, really grateful for their time and energy. The CBOs that I mentioned before, there's the key 24, and then there's 170 subgrantees that have received smaller grants in our community, all to work as a, a coordinated team to get what we call engagement numbers which are numbers that really let us know the effectiveness of our campaign. And Justin will speak about the numbers in a second, but I also want to speak to another um, element of our design that isn't listed here, which is our, um, our volunteer and service teams. Another really important part of the architecture is to leverage CERT volunteers, community emergency response teams, and the LISTOS program that started in Santa Barbara, which is a um, Spanish, in, um, Spanish language, family preparedness, in-home, amazing um, preparedness program that is now in 60 different um, communities. Taking that Vistos program, CERT, and then AmeriCorps, another great federal resource that um, has resources that come down to the state level. And what we do with those resources is have them all working together to ensure that there's this education that is going on. So if you as a community member wants to be prepared for disasters, you might be touched by any one of these um, entities with either a five minute kind of quick education moment, or you could be involved because you've decided to become a CERT volunteer and you have 20 hours of training and everything in between. So I, I share that so that you recognize that it's at minimum a five minute a review of the five steps of preparedness, which we've uh, created by doing a very thorough inventory of all of the preparedness campaigns that have, have happened, and yet what our data is telling us people really need to know. Um, so that helped inform the, the curriculum that we created. We then made sure that we're offering it in the languages that are most um, frequently spoken by non-English speakers in these 24 counties. That's how we came upon this list of languages. And then Justin, do you want to speak a little bit about um, the engagement numbers? Like where we are today? Um, well, no, just like the difference between a typical engagement number versus oh. a communication. Yeah. Um, Karen likes to have me do this because like we get like we get like super crazy about like what is an engagement, what's not, and Rico's smiling because he knows and it's super painful, but like this is the one area that Karen and I are both like super crazy about um, and reporters call us and they're like, you know, we've talked to your partners and you know, they think this is a great campaign, but the one area that they're like the most concerned by is like the requirement of engagement numbers, which are so stringent and, you know, it's, it's a challenge for them. And we're like, true. It guilty. Is. <laughs> um, guilty. Guilty. Um, and the reason why is because the, the, the one kind of anchor goal of this campaign was to reach at least a million diverse and vulnerable people with culturally and linguistically competent information, right? The very people that have not had the privilege traditionally of being able to access, understand, and afford 
preparedness information. Um, and so in doing that, we really wanted to make sure that we were being kind of true to the word uh, and, and, and reaching that goal. And so for an example, we were designing a whole in-person dynamic, um, robust campaign in which we had partners that were going to go into that, that represented undocumented communities going into undocumented communities. We're going to have, um, you know, really robust work at um, older California, California assistance assisted living centers to do in-person workshops um, with, our, with our older community members. Um, and all that had to change during COVID. And one of the things that people were gonna do were, in, were door to door, very similar to voter engagement work, it's kind of a door to door campaign. And um, what is not considered an engagement is taking this robust packet of information, it's be the most amazing kind of gold standard information in the world going door to door and then leaving it on someone's doorstep and then walking away, not an engagement. <laughs> See, as, as Rico is holding up his gold standard, beautiful display of information. If you came to your door and held that up or what Karen, the, the disaster guy that Karen's holding, they come to your door, holding it up, holding up that, sending that information on your doorstep. Can't count that as an engagement. You have to knock. Someone has to open the door. You have to have a conversation, at least five minutes. We'll talk about our five steps, which we'll get to in the next slide, um, and be able to count that person, you know, understanding who you're talking to, understanding the demographics um, that the best you can determine, um, getting their contact information if they'll give it to you to be part of our movement, our preparedness movement. Um, or you go to an event and you speak to a group of 50 people, um, and the Hmong community in Fresno, and you know that they're Hmong and that they're family members, and you're doing that work, you can count them and understand the demographics um, as a um, for an engagement. Doing billboards, doing media, doing flyering, at, you know, cars, those are all great communication strategies, but not part of the engagement. How was that, Darren? Fantastic. Let me get Perfect. the next slide. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm going to do the first two, and then Karen's going to do the next three. Um, so part of the research that we did and we, and we designed in this campaign, um, we also did an audit, an audit of a national, some international, um, state, and local preparedness information. Um, what are the, the, the resources that communities are giving out? that um, our partners at the state and local government are giving out. And one thing that we found, um, we found two kind of core takeaways from that audit. One is, um, it's a whole lot. <laughs> it's too much information. Um, my favorite example is home hardening. I'm sure many of you know what home hardening is if you, if you care about this topic of preparedness. And homeowners, I'm sure, care a lot about home hardening. And home hardening is an incredible tool to defend your home and your property against wildfire or help your community defend against the spread of wildfire. Home hardening is awesome. But if you're poor and you're a renter and you're a single mom with multiple kids um, that you're trying to put food on the table um, and you hear home hardening as a way to defend against wildfire to get your family prepared, you're already not part of the conversation. So it's too, it was too much, it was too many steps, it was too much information, there was a litany of steps for wildfire, a litany of steps for earthquake, a litany of steps for flood. Guess those, bet, bet that there's gonna be a litany of steps now moving forward for global pandemics. Um, it's a lot. The other thing we found is that most of the information provided was fragmented. A fact sheet here, information and resources over here, um, you know, a PowerPoint here. And one thing that we really wanted to do is design something that was that could be delivered in a five minute um, elevator pitch with resources to back it up, but also for organizations, both in our partners, everyone on the line who is local government or organizations that aren't part of Lisa California. We've designed for the first time, um, we're calling it like the, the, the preparedness disruptor, um, a full curriculum with PowerPoint, with train the trainer, with all the resources and information, we hired a team of people who all have expertise in behavioral um, science um, to, to help us advance behavioral change. So it's more about community and behavior shifts than it is about 
doing all the technical things that everyone wants to make sure that you're checking the box for disaster preparedness. Um, because we are trying to advance a culture of preparedness. We know people aren't prepared the way that they need to be prepared. Let's simplify it. Let's get all these resources in the hands of the public and make it all accessible and simplify the steps. If we can get more people to take these five steps, um, we'll be better able to advance that culture of preparedness so that that same mom who's a renter, who's hustling to survive, feels more empowered to do things that are tangible and doesn't, alt doesn't um, automatically get shut out because they hear things and they're told things that don't apply to them and will never be able to take advantage of. So our first step is get alerts so you know what to do. CalAlerts.org is the infrastructure that Cal OES built um, several years ago um, where it's a landing spot. If you go to that website and click on sign up, it's an overview of every county in the state and a link to every county's um, alert. Everyone on the line that's from local government, you know it, <laughs> you got the message, but now we want to help elevate that so that people know to go to your county's link to get those alerts on their phone. The second is make a plan to protect yourself and your people. Um, you know, understanding and having a, con a, a consensus on where to go if you have to evacuate. Um, just thinking about those things very simply and tangibly so you all kind of have agreed upon like one or two locations of meeting destinations, just in case you guys get split up. Also a contact list, writing down all, um, all the people that you love, their name, their phone number, maybe their address, um, oftentimes in a disaster and just in this new world we're living in, you can lose con uh, connectivity to your phone and not know how to contact them, not have their um, um, information. None of us are remembering phone numbers anymore. Maybe your home phone number and your mom's phone number, that's about it. Um, so writing down these things on a piece of paper and making sure that everyone on your list know that you put them on their list and encourage them to come up with the list and put you on their list. Karen Baker, number three. Hack that go bag. Now, um, we all know, you've heard the term probably go bag. It's basically, it's think about, you know, a formerly used backpack that your kid may have outgrown or a sack, much like what Justin is holding up, um, which is the slick, slicker version. But any, really, any bag will do. And it's just making sure that you have pre-packed some pretty key elements of this. Um, key documents, your identification, your insurance, uh, title to your home, things like that that are going to be really important that you might put in a Ziploc bag or in a document um, holder. That's going to be really important. You're going to want small amounts of cash, um, single dollar bills, five dollar bills, ten dollar bills that you can um, be able to access and use and spend for quick purchases. Um, you're going to need a map, a printed map of your area that identifies your exit strategy for your community and your family. So much of it, so many of us have become so helpful to um, our phones, and if we lose broadband connectivity. Um, a lot of people in the kind of frantic state of a disaster forget about different ways of exiting their own community. What are, what are different ways that I can get out of here if this street is blocked? You know, so having that printed map can, can make you feel a lot calmer, a lot more kind of ready to face the trauma in the moment. Um, you need your medication list. Um, you also need um, um, things quick things that you're going to be grabbing as you go out the door with your go bag. So that's all the kind of the pre-pack. You're then going to have things like whether it's your laptop, your charger, your phone, um, quick first aid kit, maybe a flashlight. Maybe that's already a pre-pack item. It just depends on where you have those throughout your home. But you put those in that bag so you're ready to go out the door. So these are items in a, in a bag that you would be able to pack within and take out the door within five to ten minutes of being told you have to leave. It's that important that you have that ready. Um, obviously, think about having to go back to your family. If you've got a lot of documents, if you've got a lot of these items that you need um, to gather. And during during this incident with COVID, you definitely want masks. Um, that's going to be important and necessary. Um, Building a stay box for when you can't leave. This is obviously in incidents 
um, like earthquakes and, and um, some fire, um, some flood, you actually may be asked to stay where you are. Um, and what we, have, after looking at the, um, all of the data, have really realized that you need up to three days of food and water that you can comfortably operate at your home um, with these supplies. So what you're going to want to do is um, have three gallons per person in your family for both drinking, cleaning, et cetera. Um, you're going to want those cans of food, and those are the ones that you can um, easily um, you know, open with a can opener. You won't need heat uh, for the food. You might want a little peanut butter and jelly. You might want some tuna. Uh, it depends on your taste. but. Um, it's going to be just important that you have really easy edibles and protein bars, things like that, set aside in, in your um, stay box. Um, so those are some important items. And then our last step, when we think this is really important in this time, is to really ensure that you are taking the time to let your friends, your family, and your neighbors know about how important it is that they prepare. Um, so we encourage you to take our disaster guide and share it with them. Um, it really will help them go through the same process that you've just gone through. Next slide. So this is a, a sample of some of the materials that we put together up at the top. You see it because it, it looks um, kind of strange, like some of the typo, but it's because it comes as a um, basic one-pager that opens and then just keeps opening until you start seeing things like this. Um, and inside, it goes all the way open, there's very um, be um, beautiful graphics that help show with pictures real specific tips. So if you're a pregnant person, if you're a person with intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, all these special scenarios that people might want to consider additional tips, it's all in this disaster ready guide. This disaster ready guide is the right price. It's free. It is digitally accessible. <laughs> I'm sounding like I'm doing a TV ad uh, right now, but um, that's what we find. This is like kind of the one critical piece we're hoping to get out to all constituents so that everyone can at least have these. And then um, if you want to speak to the additional materials, Justin. Um, yeah. Um, you, you know, on a follow-up that we'll send, we have a full breadth of materials that we've created for um, immigrant communities during um, COVID, for communities with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities, and we've partnered with different state agencies and different um, advocacy groups, um, and have had many CBOs and um, communities that represent these groups weigh in and provide input, and we have more on the way um, and they'll all be available to you. Um, we are also updating our Lucid California website where we'll be creating like an online toolkit with not only our materials and our resources, the disaster guide, but like I said, all the infrastructure that we've made available to all of our partners like Rico, um, um, Train the Trainer, uh, PowerPoint, so that we are getting as many communities um, these um, kind of blue chip standard quality materials that are accessible, tangible, graphic forward, little text, so that more communities can start having these conversations. Next slide. I won't spend too much time here, um, just being mindful of time, um, but basically bottom line is we were creating an entirely uh, dynamic in-person, person-to-person, um, in-community, highly trusted, high touch point campaign that all had to change um, in the month of, of um, February and March um, at the, um, the onset of this pandemic. Um, our campaign was set out to be very much focused around um, earthquake, wildfire, flood preparedness, but we've also broadened that to include this, this pandemic um, because um, for ob obvious reasons, the very communities that we're trying to engage with preparedness are many of the same communities, especially for black and brown folk um, and, and our frontline workers and older Californians are the same communities that are the most impacted by this, um, by this disease. So um, this is just an overview of a lot of the work that both we're doing at the statewide level with, the air, with, our, air, with our air game um, and that a lot of our partners are doing um, at the ground level um, um, of the ground game to really reach community 
um, and have repetition of message, right? They're getting it from a partner that they trust, they're getting it from TV, they're getting it from information, they're getting it from elected officials. They're, we're all kind of coming together to make sure that those that are the hardest to reach get the information. Next slide. So what this shows are the CBO partners that are um, working with. At noise, Justin is. <laughs> there. Okay. <laughs> Where you see in blue, those are the counties that we are in partnership with. If there is yellow, that's because we also have Sir Listos and AmeriCorps partners that are serving some of these same 24 counties. But in a couple of cases, we have funded programs that have been outside those 24 counties. In addition, what is not shown here and that just got finalized is a partnership with the fire safe councils, which will be in representing 50 different um, fire safe council counties. So um, that will be an overlay that will soon be added. Um, but just want to let you know that's kind of the partnership at the local level. This next slide. So I, we think well, this is so exciting. Go ahead, Justin, go. I'm just gonna be really quick, um, being mindful of time. This is basically our results to date. Um, because of COVID, we allowed partners to um, use up to 20% of their budget for COVID communications because they're the trusted partner for the state in community um, to reach vulnerable populations, the same people that are impacted by COVID, to use, uh, use campaign dollars for engagement on COVID communications but knowing that we still have to reach our goal of a million. So this just shows our benchmark that because of that policy shift and pivot in March um, and the work of our partners up and down the state from Siskiyou County down to Imperial, um, we've reached um, you know, a, one in four Californians and of that one in four, um, you know, 630,000 are part of that one million goal with that high touch. So this is just some really awesome demographic information in line with population size that we believe um, um, and, and demographics of, of how we're doing. And so more to come and the urgency just grows from here. Realizing that this campaign That's, ends uh, technically in December, 2020. So I just wanna let you know about that um, end date. Perfect. Next slide. Oh, this is the slide. So on here, this is where we turn it over to a fantastic special guests that are really the point of this conversation. We were just a window dressing. Um, I'm gonna do a quick introduction for, so bear with me, I'm gonna read their phenomenal bios because they're doing really incredible work. And we're really honored to have them and their time um, away from working with community to share with all of you, their colleagues statewide, their work to inspire you to do the same. So first we have um, Supervisor Wheeler, um, who is a 72 year resident of Eastern Madera County where he has served as a volunteer firefighter, managed over um, 4,500 acres of ranch land, and served as a trustee of various school boards, and has served as supervisor of District 5 in Madera County since 2007. Uh, district 5, which is the largest district in Madera County uh, by area, spanning from uh, Byron Dam to the base of the San Joaquin Valley to the Mammoth Mountain on the east side of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. That's incredible. Okay, the size of the district coupled with the higher um, fire danger um, within it make emergency preparedness planning a must for Supervisor Wheeler. He has found great success working with partner organizations in doing this work, such as the Yosemite, Sequoia, RC, and DC, as well as the United Way, Fresno, and Madera County. Thank you, Supervisor Wheeler, for joining us. We also have Rico Peralta, the director um, of programming and training for the United Way of Fresno Madera County. Um, Rico serves um, as director of program and training for United Way Fresno Madera County. He's a lifelong Central Valley resident. He provides coaching, mentoring, training, um, consulting to volunteers and local, regional, and statewide um, community organizations. Essentially, Rico works to ensure nonprofits serve groups um, um, and achieve the most effective and responsive results for the programs um, uh, that, that they have to serve California's vulnerable, most vulnerable residents. He gets the highest quality care, 
um, possible prior to joining the United Way of Fresno, excuse me, prior to joining the United Way family, Rico spent two decades working in the nonprofit education sector, specifically advocating for um, expanded learning and cradle to career opportunities for marginalized populations. Um, for the last year, Rico has been United Way of Fresno and Madera County's point man for the Lisa California campaign, helping underserved communities learn about the importance of emergency preparedness. And we're so grateful for his work and his leadership and um, everything that he's doing. So welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us and we give you yeah, the floor. Thank you so much, Justin. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with, uh, with our group that has gathered today. And we have, uh, in the interest of time, a video to share with you all. And so kind of breaking the uh, the, the talking uh, heads that we have going on right now. Let's let's play a little bit of video. We were so thrilled to be able to um, to produce this for you just a couple of weeks ago uh, up in Eastern Madera County. That's that area up there in blue, District Five, um, which you're, you're going to hear from um, you know the the man of the hour here, uh, Supervisor Tom Wheeler, uh, describing District Five, but as well as some of the the unique partnerships that we leveraged uh, there to just get the most out of this Listos California campaign. So if we could cue up the video, and I, I remind you guys please uh, turn up your volumes and, um, and hopefully you're able to, to see and hear this, uh, this video that we just put together for you. We are working through the technical pieces of that and yeah, we'll get going here. I preloaded it. Perfect. And I see that as we bring the video up, I will stop talking as soon as the video comes on. Um, as I said, um, you know, appreciate uh, the opportunity to be a part of the Listos California campaign. Uh, as your United Way Fresno and Madera County partner, we are two of the 24 counties that, that Karen and Justin uh, alluded to. We're the CBO that was responsible for deploying the, the Listos California campaign in our two counties. Um, it, was, uh, it has been exciting. Obviously, there's been a few unexpected uh, hiccups uh, along, along the road since we launched uh, better part of a year ago uh, in August. Um, and as Justin mentioned, we were armed with data. You know, we were armed with the latest research on a very uh, localized front for our counties of the surveys, the polls that were conducted about the best messaging. We were armed with data uh, around risk and vulnerability categories for our demographics, for our two counties. And we we were put in a position where we can make really, really informed decisions to be very deliberate and intentional about how we target uh, vulnerable residents. Uh, what is most unique about this, um, this, this project, and at least from my part, and I think many of you all on the call would be able to appreciate um, as leaders in our, in our statewide community, how challenging it is to be in a position of leadership right now, whether in an organization, in a municipality, in, in, a, in a county or statewide, um, how refreshing it can be to get a, a hold of an initiative, uh, a pilot like this is, that actually lifts up your work. Um, and so to say that at United Way, we're the ones that bring you your 211 um, you know, call operations service. We're the ones doing free tax services. Hopefully all of you have prepared your, your tax returns. Today's the deadline. Uh, we provide all of these services on a systemic level for vulnerable residents in our communities. But what's, what's cool about Listos, well, at least you know, for my part, was that we were able to amplify so many of the messages of, of our cross-section of, of um, services and programs with this emergency preparedness message. So um, in a day and age when everything's so divisive and politicized, you can't politicize emergency preparedness. You know? um, and so this is, uh, this is our video. Hopefully we, we can play it and, uh, and you all will be able to hear it. Okay, so that's still, um, here we go. All right, so that's, um, that's perhaps the video that's playing, but we're not getting any audio right now. Um, you know, of course, um, just as I mentioned, the hiccups that can come along the way in our, in our campaign, there's always gonna be hiccups when you're operating in a virtual reality that is uh, COVID-19 and, uh, and uh, social distancing and sheltering in place. Let's go ahead and stop it there. Um, we have uh, shared with you, uh, for your benefit, the link to this video. This video is available on YouTube. Um, it is it is public. Uh, as I said, it's uh, it, it's it's fresh off the uh, the, the the editing block, and uh, and we'd love for you to, to to have an opportunity to view it. Uh, we really do feel like it captures the essence of the work that we did up there in Eastern Madera County. 
Um, but, but going back to, to what I was saying, and, and again, in the interest of time, we only have you here until 3.30, and our hope was that we could maybe help you reclaim a little bit of your time this afternoon. We'll just go ahead and, and kind of boogie right through some of the talking points here, uh, and then at your leisure, watch the video. Um, so I just want to say uh, on behalf of United Way that uh, when I say that we lifted up our work, um, it was by braiding the messaging of emergency preparedness into each of our programs and services. I mentioned taxes. When folks were, were coming in and having their taxes done in person in Madera County and Fresno County, uh, they were greeted with uh, you know, a waiting and reception area that was playing messaging about emergency prep, and we were distributing uh, those, those goodie bags, those takeaways, uh, which we were also then se seamlessly plugging census as well, events that were happening, free internet, things like this. Um, and we we're having a conversation with them because as Justin pointed out, we had to meet a better uh, threshold for, for what, what is an engagement. You know, it wasn't just a, as I like to say in outreach and education, it's not just a spray and pray, you know, just push the information out, leave it on a reception table, but it was, we need to have the conversation. We need to make sure this message is sticky. So the minimum was that five minutes. So with these folks that were in tax appointments, they were waiting an excessively long time. Uh, they're waiting for uh, their, their tax appointment to be called. They have all their documentation. They've got their, they got their 10, uh, 1099s. They got their W-2s. They got their identification. So we made sure it's like, hey, what are you going to do with all that information? So let's make sure we give them a bag. Let's talk about document protection. Let's talk about uh, financial stability and these types of things in the context of taxes. It's emergency prep. Same thing with two-on-one, co collecting data, compiling data. And we kind of flipped the script on two on one. Instead of waiting for people to just call us, we used our database to reverse two on one, and we started calling people with a script about emergency prep. These are things we had to do when we had to pivot out of uh, pandemic, pivot in COVID-19. And, and I just must say um, that there were challenges, of course, that we can all point to of trying to implement a campaign during a pandemic, but there were also some very real uh, benefits on the ground for us. Uh, as I had mentioned to Karen and Justin and the rest of the campaign partners, our folks in, um, in most of the, the districts in Madera County and Fresno County, they don't see a lot of earthquakes. They don't, we, we did have one the other day, but um, it was you know, mild, right? Uh, we didn't see in most of the populated areas fires and floods. So we knew there was going to be a great deal of complacency around preparedness. What better um, launching pad for a conversation about being better prepared in your household, in your neighborhood, in, in your uh, city than the, the focusing event that is coronavirus um, in terms of how it caught us completely unprepared across our systems, across our, our, our cities, uh, county and state and, and federal government and, and the entire apparatus of healthcare. So let's have that conversation. And it is, it is so resonating with our, with our community when we can have that conversation about making sure that you got a little bit of PPE, you got your mask, you got your hand sanitizer, you got your, your steps about preparing yourself for, for coronavirus. And let's talk about the next disaster that might you know, be plaguing your uh, local community and let's make sure you're ready for it. Um, so to speak to specifically Eastern Madera County, the data that we were armed with told us uh, two, two things that really stood out to us. When we looked at that map and we looked at the overlay of vulnerability and risk categories, like Karen pointed out about um, the folks that are, that are elderly, um, aging populations, and folks that are living with disabilities, um, we saw that there was uh, huge, uh, dense populations up in District 5 of, of aging and of disabled folks. Um, we wanted to use that data to be very specific around when we talked with uh, Tom Wheeler and his staff. Um, and we started service and we were invited to, to participate in a, uh, a task force on emergency preparedness up in Eastern Madera County, which consisted of a broad cross section of, of city, uh, of county, of, of really, you know, these, these local uh, first responder community, the Red Cross, uh, tribal uh, populations that are up there, lots of, lots of interested stakeholders. And what they did is they helped us to inform our, our rollout. You know, um, who were we going to fund? We did a competitive bidding process. And so it was really unique that Listos gave us the latitude, the autonomy, the discretion to fund our own CBO partners that would be able to reach the target communities that we wanted to hit. And in this case, elderly and uh, disabled. And so that helped to inform that strategy. Uh, Tom and his staff, uh, you know, Supervisor Wheeler was fantastic in making introductions, kicking down doors for us. Um, we didn't come into this with this, uh, you know, mentality that uh, here we were, the Listos California campaign, the new emergency preparedness brand and, 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 and strategy, 
we wanted to find out who else were the players. We mentioned American, the Red Cross. We mentioned uh, another group, Yosemite uh, Sequoia uh, Resource Con Con Conservation and Development Council, uh, Yosemite uh, RCDC. And they had actually some really cool localized materials for getting folks fire ready. And we, we didn't want to compete. You know, we called this about lifting up the messaging. PG&E was also on that task force, and they had a lot of messaging they wanted to get out around uh, public safety power shutoffs. So we didn't want to say, like, we're going to get into this lane and dominate the conversation. No, we're going to try to speak with all of our voices and disseminate this information to the most vulnerable. And that's what really made this, this uh, unique. That's what made it sticky. Uh, and I think that's what really um, has, I don't know, catapulted our results a little bit, uh, given it a little bit more longevity, a little bit more sustainability in the communities. And, um, you know, I just can't say enough about the partnership that we had with uh, Supervisor Wheeler, his staff. Uh, I got to give a shout out to his chief of staff, Bobby McCauley, who is a real connector because, you know, in a day and age, many of the leaders on this call, you know, there's a lot of folks that like to count dots. Uh, these folks like to connect them. And um, they made sure that we uh, came from this campaign, we're armed, we're ready, and uh, we were informing on the ground exactly what was going to happen. So we, we had the, uh, the, um, the discretion and, and, and the uh, direction to just make sure that we were reaching those vulnerable categories. Uh, so, so no competition uh, up there in, in District 5. What was fantastic is we were able to make things happen uh, for, for our residents. And Supervisor Wheeler, we would love to hear from you and what your experience was in this work um, in working with, with Rico and his team and um, leveraging your experience and insight in this space. Um, please, please share. Yeah. <clears throat> but I don't know where to start with all the guys, all the stuff you, uh, you, all three of you have put out there, four of you, I guess, with Erica too and her start of it. You know, partnerships is the most important thing you can do. And living up here all my life, I moved up here in uh, 1958, so 62 years, not 72 years, but uh, when I was in high school. And uh, I got elected to the school board when I was 28 years old because I had a handicapped daughter and they wouldn't want to, they didn't want to take care of her. so. I got elected and I changed some of that. But when, after I been on school board a while, I, I realized that partnerships are so much in, more important and joining together. So we started an annexation uh, process of annexing our little schools in our little communities here in Eastern Madera County. And we started doing that. And uh, Northport board I was on annexed was Chuanakee School and, and it raised our, uh, uh, our dollars for every day, $88 from like uh, two or $3,000 per student to $5,000 per student. So then we went down to Spring Valley. We just kept doing that. We went across to Fresno County. We worked together a lot because we're the same type community as Fresno and Madera. Anyway, we act next them all together. So I, I, I learned real young that partnerships and working together is really important. So then I got on the Corsco Resource Conservation District and it didn't take too long and I was the chairman of it. And then we made, we had the first partnership MOU with the state of California Fish and Game. Nobody else ever had one there. And I, I pressured them so bad because we were writing a uh, how to live in the foothills and how to live with oak woodlands, how to live in them. Because, you know, people come up here in Valley and they just cut down a hundred year old white oak and they don't realize how, long, how old it is. So, and what that does to our environment. And so we, uh, then we, I joined the Madera County uh, Burn Association uh, for having control burns. We used to have one to five control burns all the time trying to make our uh, community more fire safe. And, uh, and then we had logging going too, which really helped on, in the forest. And then we, uh, uh, the air board kind of put a halt to those. We haven't had very many control burns since. But uh, then we started uh, uh, trying to get some of these dollars to fuel, uh, make our, harden our communities fuel breaks and stuff. So Madera County alone, well, I was the chairman and part of the uh, Corsco Coast Resource Conservation District. We did some with Fresno too, with the Sierra Coast Coast, uh, Sierra uh, Conservation District. We did over uh, 30 miles of fuel breaks around our communities up here and over 33,000 acres of fuel break, I mean, of fuel reduction. And uh, that kind of got me really going. And then we, then we like I said, we, we uh, wrote, got a grant and wrote, uh, 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 pamphlets on how to live in the foothills and how to live with uh, two of them. The other one was uh, 
uh, how to live in oak woodlands. And I don't know if any of you know Rick Staniford, uh, University of California. He's a guru of oak trees and in California. And uh, and so we we did all that stuff. And then because we knew we had the heart in our communities. And then when the uh, 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 environmentalists stopped all of our logging, it really got bad. And then we had our drought, and then it got worse. So we 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 put a emergency preparedness team together, and I don't know if you can see that, but that's that's all everybody on it. We meet once a month, and uh, we're doing it viral now, zooming, and uh, but it has everybody, government agencies, county, city, everybody that we meet and see how we can uh, design and, and protect our people. Those packets you have, I really want to get those fold out deals because we got some similar, but not as nice as that one. So I want to try to get some for us. But we, uh, uh, then uh, Madera County, we pushed the sheriff and I got together and we pushed for this uh, reverse 911, one of the first ones in the uh, state to do that. So when we have any kind of uh, flooding, we had, we've had that up here in our uh, creeks and rivers up here. Um, and so we have anything of flooding, fires, uh, hazardous materials like a train uh, overturned a few years ago and uh, all it had hazardous materials floating out. So we can draw a line on a map on GPS and then they can reverse 911, everybody that's in that area. And more counties are doing that now, but we're one of the first ones in the state to do it. And then we come up with uh, 311. So you can, if you're in Madera County, you can dial 311, get any department, you get a live person. We, we hired like seven or eight operators. That's what they do from eight to five. And we can get a hold of anybody. And we and we updated our uh, emergency plan, evacuation plan. We try to do that every couple, three years. I really push to get that evacuation plan inside of our phone books up here. But uh, the sheriffs don't like that because they, they got an area, say a school, that would be a, one of the areas that could be evacuation uh, center. When they done that, they, uh, they said that, uh, what if everybody just headed for that uh, particular site and that's where the fire was? So when they do the reverse 911, they actually tell the people uh, to uh, where to go. And if you want to stay, get ready, we'll come by, all kinds of things like that. So the main thing, I, and we work with the Native Americans up here. We got quite a few different tribes and we work with, like I said, with, and, and, and when you talk about, uh, underprivileged people they really are i grew up with them and i try to do everything i can to help them any way i can so we always involve them in every every event that we do every uh, pamphlet we do every flyer so uh it's I, i'm just trying to I, i'm trying to cover a lot of stuff we just voted some more money in to uh, increase our firewise communities i represent seven communities up here in eastern madera county from the merced border over to the fresno border and boy, and I have town halls, and I have my town halls. I have Cal Fire, I have the sheriff, I have the OES, I have everybody there to talk, and depending on what season it is and, and what it might be, and so we can help those communities. And I, I don't want to talk too much because I could talk forever on this stuff, but I, because I, I want questions, I really like to hear from people what they think. And uh, if, you, if there's any other questions you guys think I should talk, let me know. We we are getting lots. We're actually getting lots of questions, so we're super excited to um, to get to those. Supervisor Wheeler, your remarks were perfect, um, and we do have a little time left over in this until about 3:30 to answer some of those questions, so so we can get right to it. Um, sure. Why don't we start? First of all, thank you all. This has been such phenomenal information that you've shared with us. It's really important, and it's kind of nice for us to kind of recenter, right, and realize there is a continuing and ongoing risk. And that there's a role that all of us can play, particularly those in local government and community-based organizations. And I love the theme of partnership, collaboration, working together, and, and elevating and magnifying a unified voice. Uh, there were a couple quick questions that we had, just clarifying questions from the audience. Um, and so I'll start with those, and most of them are for the LISOS team. Really quickly, just um, really short answers. Um, how, um, talking about your approach. Is the wildfire hazard map that you showed in your presentation based on the CPUC map for wildfire risk? And there's a specific question up the, up the basis of that particular wildfire hazard map as you were pulling that together. 
Well, these are, yeah, um, they're maps that, that Cal OES had, um, and so I don't have the top, the top of mind, but we, um, in the link that we provide everyone, um, each, each county has its own little report on all the maps, and so it also goes right. through what maps were specifically used. So folks can go in and understand exactly the data and the, and the resources we pull. I don't have a top of mind, but it's listed in each county's profile. Perfect, thank you. And then we had another question about, um, is it on your website, and maybe you guys can uh, provide us with a link that we'll put into the chat on where people can find the 24 counties that are currently working on the campaign? Yeah, so that's listed under alisoscalifornia.org, um, right on the site. Um, if you go to the, either the press release from the initial kickoff of the event, there's the list of all of the, the counties and the CBOs that received the, the first primary grant. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll just take some of these questions in order. Um, we got a lot of questions about partnerships, and so we're gonna we're gonna jump around to a couple of you um, to talk about that. But some of the first questions we got were related to the vulnerable populations and thinking about um, first of all how much we love that it's a grassroots and people centered movement. But as you guys mentioned, many people that are vulnerable may also be low income. And buying the supplies that are needed for preparedness is sometimes too expensive. Renters may not have space to store those supplies for 72 hours or more. Um, so I think some people on the phone are thinking it's not just about education; it's also about it's about resources. And I don't—they're asking if the Lisos campaign or Cal OES has any programs or, or opportunities to address some of that as well. Well, um, I can speak for a, a bit, and Justin, please chime in. Um, one of the things that's really unique about the way that we um, designed the whole disaster ready guide and um, all of the steps for getting prepared is we actually have a little calendar on the bottom of one page that tells you what's the one task you could do each week on a limited income to get ready. It helps you both kind of parcel out getting ready, but also affording the ability to get ready. So maybe you can't afford putting away and stockpiling some food in a stay box, but you could buy one extra can a week, right? And put it in your stay box. So the whole design of the campaign is not for you to go out and buy expensive um, disaster preparedness supplies, but instead you realize everything that you need, you have around your house. You can have a slick document folder or you can use a Ziploc bag. You can have a cool go bag or you can have a, a, your, your kids old you know, a backpack that may even be ripped, you know, like, but you can still get things gathered together that are important and that matter. Um, that's really, you know, the, the most important part of this campaign is realizing it is, a, you know, possible, it's accessible, um, you can do it. And awesome. I would add to that, like the idea of partnership and community, the, the work that folks are doing right now you know, we, we got caught up on this in the beginning as well. When you're working with vulnerable communities, like the need of these communities is so great and so big, especially when you start thinking about preparedness and all the things that are going to make communities actually successful. And we had to have this come to Jesus like realization and like get very specific. Like we are about communications and public outreach. We're about connecting people to information and making it accessible. We cannot, with the limited funds we were given to the legislature when this campaign ends December 2020, take on all things and be all things to all people. So my advice would be for um, those communicating and doing this work and thinking about the, your own partnerships, being very intentional and specific on the type of work um, and, and programs you want to design with your CBOs and partners and to what end is so important. It sounds so simple, but you can get caught up because people are like, yeah, that's great information, but I need wheelchair access. Okay, but that's a different that's, priority. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I, we did get a couple questions as well from or people uh, listening in that are interested in connecting with a community-based organization that received least those funds uh, through the community. And so they want to understand how does that partnership process begin? What, how should they start? You know, they want to send out a mailer. They want to use your materials. They want to work with the CBO. What's that process? And, you know, are the CBOs already ready to go? or do you, they work through you? Can you walk us a little bit through that? Next slide, please, or we'll have that information. Oh, awesome. Oh, right, yeah, this slide. So 
Um, this is just our quick kind of takeaway. Like if you're in the 24 counties, here are things you can do. Um, we'll be following up with a person that we work with at Valley Vision, which is an anchor CBO here in, in Sacramento that does a lot of our TA support, excuse me, TA support. Um, they are the person that you should reach out to and they will help make an introduction um, to the CBO in the community. I will say, and Karen, please weigh in, Rico and his team in Fresno are like, rock stars and they and they're very savvy and how they work with extraordinary people who do are doing great community work like supervisor wheeler but a lot of these cbos don't have that experience or capacity and so they really need you all that know community that know kind of relationships to kind of bear with them <laughs> and work with them because they're really focused on the people they're not so much concerned about the you know other relationships because they just haven't done it before so uh, we would love for you all to connect with those cbos and help and, and share that experience of, of reaching people but they just may need a little bit more understanding awesome hey rico that's a good segue to you we, we didn't get to see the video which i'm heartbroken about but i know that it alludes to some key partnerships and your ability to create those and justin and karen has spoken uh, about how successful you were in fresno and madera counties can you talk a little bit about how that worked, what that process was, and for those uh, attendees, and there's a few of them that work closely with vulnerable populations, what are some tips you can offer for them? Tips, um, one, yeah, the approach, uh, we, we try to live united in, uh, in our message and our brand. Um, and we, we always start with like this, this mentality that we need to be asset-based. We look at our community, the ecosystem of emergency preparedness, we know that we're not the experts in the room. Uh, I wasn't even certain when I joined this campaign a year ago if I had enough fire extinguishers in the house, carbon monoxide detectors, escape routes, plans. Um, I was a bit of a hoarder already. Uh, this this uh, campaign only made that worse because like Karen said, you can have a lot of stuff in your house for free to pack your stay stay kit and your, your go bag. Um, but, but you know, looking at looking at who who are the players already on the field, and so uh, Justin gave great tips about reach out to Valley Vision. They're they're the liaison. They're the conduit for the 24 counties that are funded. The 24 counties, each of them respectively, like in ours, we already have CBOs in our network that are that are um, that we funded or that have received some other parallel funding uh, and resource that um, that could they could bring to bear. Um, CERT is a, is a great example, is very active in many of the counties throughout the 58 counties in the state, not just the 24 that are funded, um, you know, the Red Cross, um, but as well the, the, you know, the first responder community. Um, we, we made sure that we, we got trained and oriented uh, from our emergency managers at the county level so that they could kind of connect some dots for us about who were the real, you know, the real sages on this issue. Uh, who had the resources they could bring to bear like when this when this campaign first launched we were designing designing our own you know collateral and whatnot so we didn't want to reinvent the wheel what what do we already have you know what's already there so yeah just really approach it with uh with that in mind know know the landscape uh, and don't think you're doing this alone because there's a lot of people in this space uh we're just really trying to to reach the right people with this message that already exists that's awesome thank you so much uh, for Supervisor Wheeler, so there are, as you know, a lot of overlapping jurisdictions in California, and some of them have been mentioned, you know, especially as it relates to emergency preparedness and response, and ILG represents cities, counties, and special districts, and you saw in the attendee list that we've got a mix of those on the line today. Do you have, uh, as an elected official, you know, any other suggestions for local officials, local electeds about how to approach this effort? in their role as an elected, right? You're at the county level, so you have some jurisdiction and responsibility on your own right. But how do you recommend working with cities and, and counties and special districts and then also CBOs on all of this? How Can you talk a little bit about your role and your recommendation? Yeah, it's, it's a big role in Madera County. We got 142 special districts, 120 of them in my district. So uh, uh, I have to work with them all the time. And I've always done that before. So it's so important that you collaborate with everybody that's in it. When Rico got a hold of us and, and uh, said, hey, we've been working with United Way before he even come on. And so we, you know, I got him ho we're hooked up with my uh, chief of staff, Bobby McCauley. Like he said, he uh, was uh, raised up here up in uh, Eastern Madera County, too. So he kind of knew what to reach out and go after. And uh, so 
what you do, you just start uh, trying to get a hold of everyone you can and like and have these town halls. I know it's one of the things that have community meetings. I have town halls and I bring all these people together in there. I even have the sheriff, the highway patrol, OES, like I said. And and anytime there was any monies out there, I am looking for dollars from day one. When we were doing all those fuel breaks, we were getting 60% of every dollar that came in California in Madera County for fuel breaks and and, uh, and fuel reduction. So you got to reach out. We hired a, a, a grant writer for uh, Madera County so that we can still keep reaching out. And during the recession, we had to, we had one. We had to get rid of her, and, and she was great. She now works for the um, Sierra Nevada Conservancy. But uh, you've got to keep reaching out, and 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 just like I said, we went and uh, just now we funded uh, the Yosemite Squire RCND, which covers four counties: Mariposa, Fresno, Tulare, and Madera. So that gives us feelers out there too. So people are always coming to us. Say, like one of our meetings, we we meet in Clovis at the Veterans Hall. We had a guy come up and he said, "Hey, I need our community really needs some help." And so he heard about our meeting, came to it, and we got him funding to do that whole street to get it uh, fuel breaks all the way on both sides. So uh, it's just reaching out, listening, and and try to be involved. You got to be involved. I know a lot of politicians that they just like that name behind their name that I'm a supervisor, I'm a congressman, and all that shit. You know, I don't believe in that stuff. I got I'm out there. I want to be with the people and see what they need, what they want, and I'm going to try to get it for them. Yeah, it's a wonderful uh, example of servant leadership. So thank you for that. Um, so, so for the larger team, and specifically, I think Justin and Karen, we're getting a lot of questions about how to join this effort. You have 24 counties that are part of this, but you also have others, obviously, 58 counties, right? So they're not part of this. Two questions. One is, if your county is part of it, how do you connect? And it sounds like you go through Valley Vision. But if your county is not part of it, are there still opportunities to sign up? Is more grant funding coming? We've heard the campaign ends in December. You know, what's the what's the process for getting on the on the on the ship? I'll just say one thing and then let Karen say the rest. Um, this September is National Disaster Preparedness Month. It's an, an annual thing, and Lisa's California is going really big to try to get to as many communities as we can because like to be a pandemic on top of a wildfire um, and so one thing that we're going to um, ask all of you and all of your colleagues is you all know what it means to take a pledge as an elected leader you all know what it means to um, sign a co coalition letter and so we're going to circulate um, one of these um, kind of dear california letters we adopt the lisa california five steps and agree that moving forward every september to host a preparedness event of some kind um, it doesn't have to be a lot of expense. It could be um, a town hall. It could be a conversation roundtable. It could be a, a social media Zoom. But we want to start to advance this culture, right, of preparedness. And so we want to ask all of you to sign on to this letter. Our goal is to have 100 elected officials and or um, government logos, local government logos on this, so that we can announce that together in September and have you all push it out and show your leadership for signing on to do something proactive at a time of such uncertainty. But Karen, please, um, you know, give more. The thing about that is, while, you know, it's, I think it's smart to go through Valley Vision, if you have the name of your local CBO, wait until tomorrow when we're going to talk to them about this. <laughs> but, but at that time, I would just go ahead and contact them. Let them understand that you're either, if you're in, their, in one of the 24 counties, you either want to work with them to get them their materials out to your constituents, right, and to people that you know that you work with. So that could be either digitally, it could be in printed format, in, in mailings that you do. Um, you might want to work with them on, a, you know, in, in ensuring that they invest with you on, on phone banking. We have this wonderful effort called social bridging, which are phone calls that are made both to um, seniors for wellness calls as well as disaster preparedness calls. And that's across all 50 counties, 58 counties, if anyone wants that service. We just go right to the emergency manager and say, do you want us to call everyone in your county and let them know how they can be ready for a disaster? And if they say yes, we go ahead and use voter registration logs and start calling everybody in the county. So, I mean, there's things like that that you can be a part of with this campaign. You know, and, and basically work with us to, to talk to your emergency manager 
to ensure that you get the social bridging projects going in your county. Um, the, the materials, because they're digitally, you can you can send them out to all of your lists. You know, you can host um, Facebook Live or Zoom trainings. We've got, um, and we'll get these to you, trainings that are already um, produced. It can be a five minute, a 15 minute, a one hour, all kinds of different lengths that you can be, you know, provide a welcome um, remarks to and then, you know, just run um, the footage, you know, so there's, there's so many ways to do this. Um, we just so look forward to working with all of you in any way that you feel most comfortable. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I do want to do a quick time check. We have about three more minutes before we're slated to end. We do have a few more questions that we have not gotten to. What I will commit to the people on the, the phone is that we have a number of questions we received, and we're going to do our darndest to get those answers to you either live or after this via email, since many of you provided your contact information. So thank you for that. Um, and maybe we'll just take one more question. And uh, it may take us a little over time, but maybe in a minute. Can you share a quick example for the, anyone on this on this panel about how you engage the vulnerable community like the deaf, or like the hard of hearing, disabled, and homeless? Those are all very unique and incredibly vulnerable populations. Any recommendations there? Well, I can talk to you about the homeless because right now we're creating a brand new piece for the homeless uh, community, uh, people that have experienced homelessness. And we're doing actually a survey in four markets. Um, to better understand exactly how they want to become disaster ready. We know what information they're going to need, but how do they want to have that presented to them? Do they want a fold up guide? Do they want a laminated index card? Um, what other kinds of tips have they learned as someone who's experienced a disaster that would be helpful to other people who are experiencing homelessness? I think it's really thoughtful research that is based in really understanding the community itself and having them help us create the right materials for that community of people that have experienced homelessness. So that that's just like one example. Um, I don't know if you have others that come to mind, Justin. Yeah, the, the one thing I'll add is that one thing that we may intentionally did with all of our products is put them graphic, more graphics than text and very simple text. And uh, I wouldn't say a cartoon feel of the graphics, but more of a an engaging kind of a fun, approachable look. Um, the reason why I say this is because when we, when we turned around and we designed something for um, um, the disabilities community, specifically people with IDD, um, one of the biggest issues that they have is that sometimes people make things look too kiddish or mm -hmm. young or juvenile, and it's super offensive. And so, um, you know, the products we designed for them and this community um, that we're trying to reach and um, get protected is the same look and the feel of all the other products that we've designed for everybody else. And the way that we've gotten the resources out the door, because it can be very overwhelming, especially if you're a local government, of how you get this information out the door is who are the groups in your community with the credibility and the trust and the access to the community. Build a partnership with them to get that information out. It's what our local partners are doing through their sub grantees or just partnerships that they're building um, without um, funds connected to it. People are so hungry for information and getting accurate, trusted information from people that they trust. That is perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so Elisa? we are out of time. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I, I don't think a lot of the people don't care if we go over a little bit. Uh, that community is really important to us. And we work with self help. I'm uh, on the regional management uh, water group here in Madera County. And we got a. a uh, one of our groups is the DAC communities in Foothills and the Valley. And we reach out to them. We actually go out to all those communities. And whether it's for water is the main thing right now in that group. But we also do the same thing with, with uh, emergency stuff and everything like that, too. So if you get them involved, that's the main thing. And if you get self-help uh, group, they're out of Fresno, Madera. We, just like the United Way, we all work together on that. And we involve all the DAC and the com uh, homeless community. We go out to them. And uh, I think that's what we got to do. We got to remember to do that because they don't, they don't have the uh, stuff to, to get this on, on social media and TV and all that. So we reach out and go get them. And that's what we, that's what we really think is we strive for. So I think everybody's got to do that. That is fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. A few of you asked questions about how to access the resources, how to find the disaster prep guide. 
you know, a number of the things that we talked about today that we showed on the slides, we're going to push out to you as a registrant today to make sure you have access to it. Especially if you're an elected official, we want to make this as easy as possible. And you can, as you can see, the Lisa's team has done everything they can to make this a very turnkey and effective. Um, so what I want to make sure we do in this wrap up is make sure you have contact info for everybody on the screen and on the panel. Um, and I want to really thank you um, all. Uh, can we go to the next slide, uh, Randy Kay? What we hope to accomplish today, and hopefully what you did, is really understanding uh, the specific tactics that local, uh, local elected leaders can employ uh, to make sure your constituents are informed. And there are so many staff members on the phone. You have a huge heavy list of helping communicate this, and we do appreciate it. If you want to stay connected with ILG, our contact information is here. We can direct you to any of the disaster resources we've talked about, or go to the next slide. We can also make sure that you are connected uh, to our panelists. Our recording will be available very, very soon. We will email out a link to that so you can look at it online. And for those of you that weren't able to listen in person, the recording will be available on our website and you'll get that link in your inboxes as well. We plan to make sure that you have all the resources you need to really navigate this issue. And I wanna thank the LISOS team, uh, Supervisor Wheeler, Enrico with United Way is doing such phenomenal work in Fresno and Madera counties. Um, the work you're doing is important and your model is important and you're really setting an example and we would love to work with you on this even further to make sure that additional communities can participate in this and can really take advantage of all the hard work you've done. So this concludes our webinar and I wanna thank you all for being here. Um, and I really, really wanna make sure that everybody that's on the phone and or on the line today uh, knows how to reach you. So please do, Take a look, a screenshot as you need to of the people uh, on the line today. And then the website link for Listo's campaign where you can see the 24 counties that currently have the funding. And then hopefully to get on future lists related to uh, that campaign they wanna push forward in disaster preparedness month in a couple weeks. Um, we'll push, push that out as well to make sure you have the opportunity to weigh in there. So thank you all and uh, both on the panel and on the line for being with us today. Uh, we really do appreciate it. It has been an honor to have you join us. And on behalf of the entire team at the Institute for Local Government, please have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you so much. One thing I would love for our team to do, the panelists, if you wouldn't mind, just a really quick screenshot, because we didn't get to push this out, but I want to make sure that the recording also gets uh, pushed out. So uh, if we can do a real quick thank you and perfect screenshot, we will um, yeah. close this out. Excellent. One second. And Randy Kay, would you please advance the next slide? <laughs> perfect. And one second. Awesome. Thank great. you all. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Thank you. Talk to you all later. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Erica. Right. You're the best. Thank you, everybody. This is all. Yeah. Yeah.